We didn't see this coming at all. I just don't know why this happened to our son. He didn't talk. I mean, uh... Shot fired, shot fired. Good boy, the paramedic showed up. I gave him CPR for 10 minutes. I ran in our house bleeding everywhere. Uh, he said he got run over by a car. Hey, Elliot Roger here. You know, I never really heard him speak. I'm doing a lot of thinking about how sad and unfair my life has been. Life. And that will make you all suffer. Well, this is my last video. I've waited a long time for this. Nine separate crime scenes. Six Santa Barbara students lost their lives, and over a dozen more were injured at the hands of 20-year-old Elliot Roger. Even his closest friends described him as fundamentally troubled from birth. I think he's a really lonely guy. Are mass murderers born, or are they shaped by their circumstances? To understand Elliot Rogers' case, we need to examine his life from the very beginning. I wish I could be a kid again. Elliot Roger was born in London, England in 1991. His mother, Lee Chin, was a Malaysian Chinese nurse, and his father, Peter, worked as a commercial and film director. Although he was a shy child who later viewed those early years as the happiest of his life, there were already warning signs of the troubles ahead. My parents used to always take me here when I was a kid. Back when my life was happy and fair. Elliot, though highly literate, was naturally quiet and often preferred to write down his thoughts instead of speaking them. Although he was never officially diagnosed, this behavior is indicative of selective mutism, a rare childhood anxiety disorder where sufferers are unable to speak in social situations. When Elliot was six, his family moved to Los Angeles due to his parents' divorce, which occurred a year later. This was a significant upheaval for Elliot, who was already a sensitive child. The divorce and relocation were deeply traumatic for him. Within a year, his father remarried Moroccan actress Sumaya Akabune, which sparked feelings of jealousy in Elliot. He admired his father's wealth and power believing these were the keys to attracting the women of his dreams. However, Elliot would later understand the dangerous implications of thinking that money alone could win anyone's affection. Back when I thought the world was fair, how naive I was. I was only an innocent child. Elliot had few friends, and during playdates he would often wander off to be alone in bedrooms or the backyard. He disliked sharing and would become irrationally angry when required to do so. On the rare occasions he made a friend, he would become possessive and jealous if they played with anyone else. I'm so angry right now. I was enjoying a peaceful time at this beach park. And what comes to sit in front of me? A young couple, a guy with his hot girlfriend. I mean, who do they think they are? Coming here, sitting in front of me to make me feel jealous? During his middle school years, Elliot continued to struggle with making friends and became a target of ridicule. One girl in particular would mock him in front of her friends, an experience that, according to him, sparked a lifelong hatred towards women. Elliot's father, Peter, a Hollywood insider who worked on major productions like The Hunger Games as an assistant director, gave his son an up-close look at the industry. Elliot later described this exposure as a key factor in his growing jealousy, as he began to form a shallow ideology centered on wealth and privilege. Reflecting on this period, he wrote, My little nine-year-old self realized that there were hierarchies, that some people were better than others. Jealousy and envy, those are two feelings that would dominate my entire life and bring me immense pain. In an attempt to find a suitable environment for their increasingly isolated and bullied child, the Rogers moved Elliot from school to school. I've been cast out. No one likes me. No one accepts me. All my life, I've been struggling to fit in with the popular kids. I've been struggling to get a girlfriend. No one, no one has ever accepted me. Around this time, the Rogers attempted homeschooling, which only worsened Elliot's social anxiety. In 2009, he graduated from Independence High, a small school with only 100 students, but he had no clear plans for his future. Elliot attended several colleges, including Pierce Community College, where he continued to face harassment. On one occasion, a group of students threw eggs at him, and he reacted by brandishing a knife. Although no one was harmed, it was evident that Elliot was nearing his breaking point. He eventually enrolled at Santa Barbara City College, 
which boasts a campus along the Pacific Ocean with blue skies and clear weather most of the year. His parents hoped that the sunshine and college life would help their introverted son come out of his shell. Tomorrow is my first day at a new college, Santa Barbara City College. I'm feeling anxious and worried about it, but also excited. With a new college comes many new opportunities, a chance to start fresh. I'll just go in with hopes and smiles and hope for the best. However, instead of alleviating his misery, the cheerful college setting and natural paradise only deepened it. His isolation intensified, and his anger began to grow rapidly. I'm so scared about what I might possibly see there. A young couple, hot girls walking with hot douchebag guys, a guy kissing his hot girlfriend. Such sights will break my heart, tear all my soul, stab my ego, consume me with rage. I'll just have to try not to concentrate on them, pretend they don't exist. By 2011, Elliot had stopped attending classes and was sinking further into the depths of his hatred. What comes to sit in front of me? A young couple, a guy with his hot girlfriend. I mean, who do they think they are? Coming here, sitting in front of me to make me feel jealous? This is the reason why I hate the world. Everywhere I go, I'm all alone. Because Elliot chose to document his deteriorating mind in real time and upload it to YouTube, his actions, while not inevitable, became shockingly predictable in hindsight. Since I hit puberty, I've wanted girls. I've desired girls. I've been really attracted to girls. But they've never shown any attraction back to me. It's fair to say that Elliot harbored hatred towards the entire human race, but above all, he despised himself. Another month has gone by now, and I made a huge effort this month, but still, nothing. How long can I keep doing this? How much torture and humiliation can I take from the world? He held a particular antipathy towards women, blaming them for never showing any interest in him. They paid any attention to me. They talked to the other guys in the class, but not me. There were so many guys in that class who were stealing the girls from me. I hated watching them casually flirting with the girls. I hate them. Elliot appeared to believe that because he desired girls since puberty and hadn't been desired in return, he had the right to hate them. I'm the guy you should be going for, not those obnoxious slobs you love so much. I don't know why you're not attracted to me. I don't know what you don't see in me. But I'll make sure you all pay for it. I've concluded that females have a, a very flawed and perverted form of sexual attraction. Elliot's thoughts and fantasies were dominated by thoughts of revenge, but they remained mere thoughts until one day when they became a horrifying reality. While waiting in line behind a couple at a local Starbucks, Elliot's anger was triggered by their mere display of affection. He followed them out to their car and threw hot coffee on them. Later, he repeated the assault on two female students. This marked the beginning of a pattern for Elliot as he acquired a taste for inflicting pain. Yes, I'm a shy, quiet guy, but I have good qualities to myself. I'm a gentleman. You know, I'm sophisticated, I'm polite. I have good values. And I can be fun too, if they just give me a chance to open up. But girls never give me a chance because they're evil and cruel like that. Elliot believed that his designer clothes and nice car all purchased with his father's money, would compensate for his deeply lacking personality. Do everything I can to appear attractive to you. I dress nice. I'm sophisticated. I'm magnificent. I have a nice car, a BMW. Well, it's nicer than 90% of the people in my college. Um, you know, I'm polite. I'm the ultimate gentleman. And yet, you girls, you never give me a chance. I don't know why. You know, I, I, I put a lot of effort into dressing nice. These, these sunglasses here they were $300. Giorgio Armani. So I'll put them on. See? In addition to his misogyny, Elliot was also an ardent racist, frequently posting his abhorrent views online. He held a particular disdain for seeing blonde women with any man, 
but his disgust heightened when they were with men of a different color. I passed by this restaurant and I saw this black guy chilling with four hot white girls. He didn't even look good. Then later on in the day, I was shopping at Trader Joe's and saw an Indian guy with two above average white girls. What rage inducing sights did you guys see today? Don't you just hate seeing these things when you go out? It just makes you want to quit life. On bodybuilding forums, Elliot would express his disdain for men of Asian descent. When asked by one if a certain pair of shoes would help attract white women, Elliot replied with a racist remark, stating that shoes wouldn't help because white girls were disgusted by Asian men. It's worth noting that Elliot himself is of part Asian descent suggesting that his racism may be another manifestation of his profound self-loathing. It's almost been a month since that traumatic day. The day I lost the lottery jackpot that I was meant to win. Elliot would spend the $1,000 monthly allowance given by Peter on designer clothes and lottery tickets, sometimes driving over two hours to Arizona or Nevada just to purchase more. I was going to be the record-breaking lottery winner of 656 million. I still can't come to terms with the fact that I didn't win. He came to believe that winning the lottery that would solve all of his problems, and that would be the only way he could attract a woman. I should not be in this position right now. If I had won, then I would probably be driving one of my dream cars at this very instant, looking for a new mansion to buy. I would probably even have a girlfriend by now. That is how my life should be. Not this. Not this depression and suffering and loneliness. His attire and vehicle clearly weren't sufficient and he appeared oblivious to the idea of earning money through legitimate means. Turning to the lottery represented his final opportunity. I dropped my classes with the conviction that I would return to college as a rich guy who could get all the girls. Whenever Elliot faced defeat, he viewed it as a direct attack on his identity, as if the universe was conspiring against him. I thought I had a chance to become rich very quickly. I thought I would win the lottery. It was meant to be. I can't believe I didn't win. This is so shattering. What do I do now? Feeling completely hopeless, he went for a drive, using his camera phone as the sole listener to whom he could pour out his innermost thoughts. Every time I drive through this place, I am overcome with rage. Because I see so many guys walking around with beautiful blonde girls, enjoying their lives, while I've lived here for, for more than two years in loneliness. No one's ever invited me to parties. No girls have been attracted to me. I've never had the pleasure of walking through this town with a beautiful girl on my arm. So many beautiful girls walking around here. But they would never give me a chance. See, look at that one. I just passed one. They would reject me at every turn. Here I am, Elliot Roger beautiful, magnificent gentleman. Though the girls around this town don't see it. They hang around with those slobs, those obnoxious, horrible, disgusting men. But they never give me a chance. That's why my life is so unfair. Oh look, even more houses full of obnoxious, college students right there. <sighs> this world does not make sense. Although Elliot saw himself as an individual, he lacked empathy for those he considered less attractive. Hot young sluts who would just reject me. And these, look at these douchebags right here. These assholes, these obnoxious little slobs. You see guys like this. Oh wait, no. Not guys like those. Those guys were ugly as fuck. This combination of feeling inferior and superior is a dangerous blend, a prominent characteristic often associated with an undiagnosed narcissistic personality disorder. Ah, police car. Whoa. God damn. I'm so glad that police car didn't stop me for holding up my cell phone. <laughs> I've already gotten a parking ticket this month. Despite Elliot's antisocial tendencies, he displays a significant respect for authority and harbors a deep concern about receiving a ticket from the police. This might seem contradictory to the image of a strong, independent individual, 
but upon closer inspection it aligns closely with his profound insecurity. It's likely that he fears and respects the police because he covets the power they wield. And look, that's the house I got beat up at when I walked in on a party. That was about almost a year ago now, back in August of 2013. A year later, Elliot found himself grappling with the rejection of everything he believed he had to offer the world. His aspirations had all been dashed, leaving him feeling deprived of everything he ever desired. The entire female gender must have something mentally wrong with them, to be so evil and cruel to me by starving me of love and sex, while they eagerly give it to other men. With no other options remaining, the only course of action left for him was to seize it. They're all mentally ill. They must all be punished and I will be the one to punish them. His decline was absolute, leaving no hope for a future, not for Elliot nor for anyone who dared to oppose him. The girls are not attracted to me. There's a major problem with that. A major problem. That's a problem that I intend to rectify. <laughs> I will not let this fly. It's an injustice that needs to be dealt with. Well, this is my last video. It all has to come to this. Tomorrow is the day of retribution. The day in which I will have my revenge against humanity. Against all of you. It appeared that Elliot had been waiting for the perfect natural light to capture his final video. He dedicated time to ensuring that his last message would be a masterpiece, driven by his cinematic fantasies. In his mind, Elliot was preparing for a dramatic departure as if he were driving off into the sunset. You girls have never been attracted to me. I don't know why you girls aren't attracted to me, but I will punish you all for it. It's an injustice, a crime, because I don't know what you don't see in me. I'm the perfect guy. And yet you throw yourselves at all these obnoxious men instead of me, the supreme gentleman. I will punish all of you for it. <laughs> the difference between Elliot's usual videos and those where he portrayed his malevolent character is striking, serving as a poignant reminder of the artificiality inherent in his persona. I'll be a god exacting my retribution and all those who deserve it and you do deserve it just for the crime of living a better life than me elliot displayed pronounced signs of extreme narcissism alongside a total absence of empathy his simmering rage coupled with an inability to sustain aggression constituted a troubling concoction resembling unchecked psychopathy all oh, you popular kids you've never accepted me all i've ever wanted was to love you and to be loved by you. I've wanted a girlfriend. I've wanted sex. I've wanted love, affection, adoration. But you think I'm unworthy of it. That's a crime that can never be forgiven. After the extensive diatribes of hate Elliot had unleashed in his videos, it seems somewhat incongruous to hear him speak of love and shared affection. However, there are indications that he was capable of such emotions. Whether genuine or a facade, he did demonstrate affection towards his family. In recent months, he had even taken steps to mend his relationship with his half-brother Jazz. Yet no amount of love could quench the fire of hate that had consumed him. While Elliot's plans were already horrifying, they were initially even more so. Alongside the massacre he eventually carried out, he had intended to kill his stepmother Sumaya and even Jazz. Like many of Elliot's actions, his motivation stemmed from petty jealousy. Jazz's burgeoning career as a child actor and Elliot's claims that Sumaya deliberately made him feel inferior to her biological son's success were cited. Whether these claims hold any truth can only be speculated upon, given Elliot's history of delusion. After all of my most recent revelations, I've been feeling so trapped. It is so tragic how my life has fallen to such darkness. It is finally reaching its culmination. 
and I feel very overwhelmed and anxious. At this juncture, it became evident that Elliot had experienced a total psychological breakdown. His subsequent actions would reveal the horrifying consequences of this collapse. Even within the grim history of American spree killings, his rampage would stand out, fueled by a particularly intense bout of psychotic rage. I am so godlike. Before uploading what later became known as the Retribution video, Elliot meticulously edited out these final seconds. This attempt to portray a godlike persona contrasts starkly with the real Elliot we have come to know through his writings and videos. The authentic Elliot is not godlike. Instead, he is violent, cruel, self-loathing, and pathetic. Despite this, he will soon take on the role of God in the most literal sense possible. And in turn, I will deny all of you life. <laughs> It's only fair. I hate all of you. The Retribution video was released shortly before the massacre, though this wasn't the originally intended date. One month prior, on April 26th, while his father was away, Elliot had planned to carry out the killings of Sumaya and Jazz. Fortunately, fate intervened. Elliot fell ill with a cold, and his father returned home unexpectedly, sparing the lives of all three. I have nothing to live for now. Nothing to live for but revenge. My revenge will be so sweet. It will be perfect, beautiful, glorious. A week before the initially planned date, other videos revealing signs of Elliot's mental deterioration surfaced. As they started gaining traction, particularly after being shared on Reddit, fellow students recognized Elliot's name. While some dismissed the videos as laughable or pathetic, others grew concerned that the person depicted on screen might be a ticking time bomb. Alarmingly, many found themselves identifying with the whining self-pity portrayed, a trend that would sadly become increasingly prevalent in the years that followed. Yes, I'm a shy, quiet guy, but I have good qualities to myself. I'm a gentleman. You know, I'm sophisticated. I'm polite. Concerned after not hearing from her son for several days, his mother turned to the internet in search of any news or updates. Instead of the reassurance she sought, she stumbled upon recent videos and a troubling portrayal of her son's state of mind. Alarmed by what she discovered, she promptly reached out to mental health authorities, who then alerted the police to conduct a welfare check at his apartment. I hate all of you. Humanity is a disgusting, wretched, depraved species. However, upon their arrival and subsequent conversation with him, authorities perceived Elliot as a remarkably courteous young man deeming him neither a danger to himself nor to others. Little did they know that had they delved deeper, they would have unearthed his elaborate and heinous scheme along with the arsenal of weapons he had acquired to execute it. Elliot's planned atrocities far surpassed the savagery of his actual actions. His chilling blueprint involved luring victims into his apartment one by one, subjecting them to brutal torture involving knives and scalding water. Subsequently, he intended to decapitate them and discard their heads from his moving vehicle as he terrorized the streets of Isla Vista. To execute this macabre plan, he first needed to eliminate his roommates, whom he methodically targeted throughout the day. 19-year-old George Chen, merely a guest of Elliot's roommates, tragically became his initial victim. Brutally assaulted in the bathroom, Chen endured 94 stab wounds in a frenzy of vengeful fury. As Chen lay in a fetal position, the killer made a feeble attempt to tidy the bloodied scene with paper towels. Elliot then lay in wait for his roommates, David Wang and Chung Yuan Hong, viciously attacking them upon their return home, leaving their lifeless bodies draped in bedclothes. The interim between the murders and Elliot's rampage remains shrouded in mystery. Witnesses observed him engrossed with his laptop in the apartment building's parking lot around 8.30 p.m. shortly thereafter, at 9.17 p.m. Elliot uploaded a video of retribution, followed a minute later by the dissemination of his manifesto, My Twisted World. In this manifesto, he detailed his disturbed and resentful ideology, attributing blame to humanity for perceived wrongs, with a particular focus on women. Treatment from women is ten times worse than from men. It made me feel like an insignificant, unworthy little mouse. Upon receiving Elliot's manifesto, his therapist wasted no time in contacting Elliot's mother, Lee Chin. As Lee Chin watched the disturbing retribution video, she urgently attempted to reach out to her ex-husband, Peter. 
minutes ago, I finally checked my email. I saw this letter. It's from Elliot Roger, who's a Santa Barbara City College student. It's 141 pages. And when you get to the end, which is where I went to immediately, page 134, it's a very detailed attack they plan on taking in Iowa Vista, including shooting people and driving in a car to intentionally run over pedestrians and then shoot themselves. Unbeknownst to the horrified parents as they hurried to Isla Vista, the grim reality dawned upon them that their intervention was tragically belated, a truth that had been obscured for years. I am going to enter the hottest sorority house of UCSB. The killer made his way to the Alpha Phi sorority house, where the security of a locked door held the potential to spare dozens of lives. Despite weeks of stalking the house, he appeared oblivious to the fact that entry required a code. His persistent knocking went unanswered by the girls inside, further fueling his mounting fury. Now consumed by rage, he sought to unleash his violence upon anyone unfortunate enough to cross his path. Okay, one, I'm getting uh, rise over here. Local gunshot wound on the corner of Del Norte and Segovia. Okay. Del Norte and Segovia. Like 14 meters, the medic, code 300. He noticed three girls standing outside and immediately opened fire, tragically ending the lives of 19-year-old Veronica Weiss and 22-year-old Catherine Cooper, while injuring a third. Shortly after the knocking ceased, the sorority girls inside were jolted by the sound of gunshots. Rushing to the window, they witnessed the horrifying sight of the victims lying wounded or lifeless on the lawn. In the chaos, the third victim was heard pleading with her mother over the phone, repeating the haunting words, I'm going to die, as terror engulfed her. This is your emergency. Um, we have a shooting on Embarcadero Del Norte. In Barcadero, okay, we're on in Dr. Taylor's own, okay? Uh, uh, go read uh, Isla Vista. No, I know. We're on, um, like, what, what block or what's the nearest cross street from there? Uh, it is Segovia. Okay. Segovia and Barcadero Del Norte. Did you actually see the person shooting the gun, or did you see what it made contact with, or did you just I hear it? I saw the car. You saw a car? Did it make contact with anybody? Okay. Yeah. Who? We have three girls, three women. That got, they got shot? Yes. Responding to reports of multiple gunshots fired downtown at the Isle of the I-3 Delhi, officers arrived on the scene. However, nearby students initially mistook the gunfire for fireworks. Their attention was drawn to a frantic figure dashing across the parking lot and fleeing into a black car, which swiftly sped off in the eastbound direction. 911, what's the address of the emergency? I'm at Ivy Delhi. You're, you're dodging somebody else is on the line. Okay. I don't know what happened. Okay, were you injured? Were you injured? Okay, where are you? Somebody else is. We're at Ivy Delhi and I'll just, uh... Okay, you're at Ivy Delhi and somebody's shot? Yeah. Okay. What happened? Okay. Okay, I understand. Okay, I'm getting help started. Do you know how many people are hurt? Following the sounds of screams, police rushed to the Isla Vista Deli. There, amidst the chaos of panic-stricken students, they discovered the lifeless body of 20-year-old Christopher Michaels Martinez, fatally wounded by a gunshot to the chest. The assailant persisted in driving through the college town, indiscriminately shooting at bystanders and deliberately striking them with his vehicle, inflicting injuries on multiple individuals. His violence escalated when he targeted a police officer, prompting the authorities to return fire for the first time. Faced with resistance, he fled the scene once more. I was shot at from a two-door BMW, westbound from Alamogadon. Did you get on progress? Did you get on progress? Victor, we got another gunshot. Victor, at shot fire, shot fire. As he continued to fire at bystanders from his vehicle, multiple officers responded by returning fire, with one bullet finding its mark in his upper left thigh. Despite being wounded, he attempted to escape once again but soon collided with the rear of a black jeep. Elliot's vehicle, now perforated with bullets and leaking gasoline, was swiftly surrounded by officers closing in and issuing commands. His quest for retribution reached its grim conclusion as he chose to end his own life with a single gunshot to the head. Upon searching the scene, 
police discovered a cache of prescription pills, knives, three pistols, six empty 10-round magazines, 548 rounds of unspent ammunition, and his phone containing over 200 selfies. My name's Sean Covey, I'm Park Manager at IV, the apartment. Um, and I know something's going on in IV. I just got an email from one of the residents, and it's like, really disturbing and it's like okay there's been a there's, there's been a shooting in id no no i understand that but i got an email from a resident and it's like 141 pages long and it says like the life of elliot roger okay and at the end it talks about killing people okay yeah so, we uh we actually have somebody else what's your name as police began piecing together the events it was only a matter of time before they uncovered the horrors concealed within the apartment Alongside the tragic discovery of his roommate's lifeless bodies, authorities stumbled upon a chilling array of items belonging to the perpetrator. Among these were a dagger, a sledgehammer, a printed copy of his manifesto, unsettling diary entries and drawings, and an assortment of knives. Notably, the diary appeared tampered with, with entries removed and hastily reattached. A particularly chilling passage from the final entry dated May 23, 2014, ominously declared, I have to tear some pages out because I feared my intentions would be discovered. I taped them back together as fast as I could. This is it. In one hour, I will have my revenge on this cruel world. I hate you all. Die. There was a young girl laying right here. And she was, I could just tell immediately that she was gone. She, I, I saw a gunshot wound to her abdomen and like on her side and also one to her head. Uh, so you could tell she wasn't bleeding anymore, so she was gone. In just a fleeting eight minutes, the tranquility of Ila Vista shattered, leaving an indelible mark on the community. For many, Elliot Roger epitomizes a tragic example of unchecked hatred, a life of privilege tarnished by petty and secure envy. However, to a disturbing few, he is heralded as a hero, a figure of wisdom, even a pioneer of callous mass violence, a twisted embodiment of their darkest fantasies, in their warped perspective, his actions are lauded as courageous, when in reality, they stem from nothing but a pitiful and misguided manifestation of hatred. Our son Christopher Martinez and six others are dead. Our family, our family has a message for every parent out there. You don't think it'll happen to your child until it does. Chris was a really great kid. Ask anyone who knew him. His death has left our family lost and broken. The father of Adam Lanza now says that there are times he wishes his son had never been born. Do you ever feel that way? That's a really loaded question. Um, I. That's a loaded question, Barbara. A part of me says yes. And the reason is because he did an awful lot of harm to young men and young women who didn't deserve to die. And my son did it 